face to face I'm here to meet you Lord, I wait Come and set my heart in place But I need you Is it hard to trust? You've never failed a sparrow. You've never lost a son. You know the recurring questions that I don't have the courage to say.
Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's good to see all of you here. Uh, welcome to Palm Sunday. Um, this is the beginning of Holy Week, uh, which, wow, I feel like Lent just flew by, but uh, it's the beginning of Holy Week here at First Three, and on Palm Sunday, we commemorate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, um, as people are waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, which means God's uh, which means save us, sorry. So if you didn't get a palm branch and you want one, they are in the back um, because during this first song that we're gonna sing this morning, the kids are gonna be walking through, waving them, and I would love it just to be a celebration. Um, but together we will shout Hosanna in our call to worship, which will be on the screen, uh, which is drawn from Psalm 118 and Matthew 21. Your parts are in bold, so just read out loud with me on your parts. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The Lord, our God, the Lord is our God and has given us light. Great is our God and we give thanks to the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna save us, O God, Hosanna. God's steadfast love endures forever. Would you stand with us as we sing these words this morning? the day in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away
you make us new Cause when we see you We find strength to face the day In your presence All our sins are washed away Washed away
praise you that you are worthy. You're our good, good father, good king who loves us so much. Pray that you would open our hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. And all glory be to you. Hosanna, in your name I pray. Amen. All right, you all may go ahead and take a seat. And um, at this time, time, we're going to move into a time of practicing generosity. Um, it's a transformational act of generosity in this season of Lent. Um, the easiest and most helpful way to support our ministry is um, through recurring online giving, which uh, you can sign up for by scanning the QR code on the back of your chairs. Um, you can also bring cash or checks to the boxes uh, in the back. Uh, and there's also plenty of other ways that you can engage in generosity throughout this season of Lent, which are on the screen uh, behind me. Um, and as we commit ourselves to growing deeper in generosity as an act of worship, uh, would you please join me in praying aloud this corporate prayer? Godliness with contempt is great gain. Sorry, contentment. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds, willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. May this be so of our community. Amen. 
And just as we want to be generous with our resources, we also want to be generous with our lives. So let's take a few minutes to stand, greet those around you who are worshiping with us, and then we'll call us back in a few minutes. So go ahead and stand and greet one another and pass the peace of Christ. Good morning. If we can go ahead and start wrapping up. Great to see lots of people fellowshipping, chatting together. Happy Palm Sunday. My name is Ryan. It's good to be here together today. Um, I'll just tell a short story since we're still getting back to our seats. Uh, they say there was once a five-year-old who was, uh, had a cold and was sick and, and stayed home and wasn't able to be at church on Palm Sunday. And then when his, uh, the rest of his family came back and had palm branches with them, they, he said, what are those for? And the dad explained, well, the, these were used to lay down in the, at the feet of Jesus as he rode by on a donkey, and the kid said, great, the one Sunday I'm sick and I miss him. So it was just a confusion, but we are thankful that we actually, Jesus is here today, and we can celebrate uh, being together and all that this next week has. If you're new here, welcome. Glad that you are here uh, visiting with us or with us again, whatever that may be. If you have only been here a few times, we want to invite you to get connected, to um, maybe stick around for six weeks, try it out, and see how, how it goes, and um, if this would be the place where God would have you to stay, we'd love to have you. Lunch and crazy craft day today, so uh, it's apparently not picnic weather outside yet, but we are going to uh, be picnicking downstairs. Come on, grab some food for you, you and your family. Um, and we can eat together in the fellowship hall, and the kids will do some crafts in the gym today after the service. On Friday, we'll be having the 
Good Friday Tenebrae service, and that will be at 7 p.m. Next week, Easter Sun Sunday, full schedule. So if you're up for it, sunrise service at Foster Beach at 6 a.m. To see, it's pretty amazing to see the light just coming up and celebrate, uh, start the day that way. Then there will be an egg hunt at 9.15 and celebrating, of course, here. If you have flowers or can get them, um, if they haven't all died in your yard by then, maybe we'll have some of the tulips by, up by then, I'm hoping. Um, bring some flowers for flowering the cross. Then there's a new uh, thing starting on April 3rd called a spacious place. Um, and that is just a time for you to come to be in this space to talk, listen, and be with God. And that is going to be starting on April 3rd and each following first Wednesday of the month. Just a time from 7 to 8.30 for some solitude and prayer and quiet uh, music, time to meditate on scripture or pray. There will be a short guided prayer and meditation time at 7.45. Child care is not provided. And as always, if you would like more information or anything that um, you might have heard about previously or wondered about or missed what I just said, you can scan the QR code and check it out on the hub. Now I'll invite Andrea to do our scripture. Morning. Today's scripture reading is from Genesis 1, verse 27, to Genesis 2, verse 3. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Thanks be to God. Hello, I'm Matt Tinkin. <laughs> now, Matt called me frantically Friday and said, I've got the flu. Can you fill in for me? So I fortunately was going to be preaching at another church and I had this sermon ready that's not really related to Palm Sunday. I'm going to try to finagle this to make it all make sense somehow. But I'm hoping that uh, this message will be a, a benefit to you and to your soul as we uh, study God's word. So my name is Steve McCoslin. I'm the superintendent for Chicagoland for the Free Church. So I, I oversee, we have about 30 or 40 churches here in Chicagoland, and it's my job to make sure the pastors are healthy and resources and, and the churches are flourishing. So uh, right now, about Haiti, and Haiti is uh, struggling politically. We have a Haitian church here in Des Plaines, and the church has been exploding with growth because everyone that's in Haiti that could get over to the U.S. came over here. And so they're doing quite well, and um, they, they need some uh, sound equipment. So if you, know where, if you know of spare sound equipment anywhere that could benefit a, a thriving young Haitian congregation, please come see me after service. All right. So uh, this sermon is about vocation. 
What does it mean to be a Christian and have a job? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What, what does God think of our work? And so I thought I'd start by sharing about my hometown. I grew up in rural Washington state. I grew up on the water in a shipyard town. It was small and um, the culture was hard to describe. I, I would call it leth lethargic, I, I would say. So um, all my friends' dads worked for the shipyard and after high school, everyone would not go to college. They would go straight to the shipyard and work. That's because the money was really good. It was a government job, so you could never get fired. And uh, you got vacation right away. And, and just everyone in the town worked there. But the work was itself kind of awful. So the, the fathers and mothers that worked there would say, I, I, got, I got away with four hours of not working today at work, and it was great. And then I left half an hour early, and no one knew. Right on, right? So everyone would work with this mentality of just getting home from work and just enjoying the weekend or just getting to the vacation. Or if you were lucky and you put in 20 to 25 years at the shipyard, you could retire young. So if you went to work there at 18, you were retiring at like in your 40s. And it was, that was just the culture of the town. And um, it left me with this feeling towards work that uh, work wasn't really good. Work is something I just need to avoid. I need to get out of, not do. It doesn't bring life or joy. So this question has been lingering on my mind ever since I grew up in that town. What is work and how does it fit into God's kingdom? What does God expect from me with work? Because it, it takes up half my day. So to start, I want to look, recall to mind Jesus' parable of the talents in Matthew 25. You don't need to turn there. I'll just kind of sum up what this, the parable is about. So. There's a master, he's extremely wealthy, he's got three servants, you can see them up here, and he, he's gonna leave for a great period of time, so he gives talents to each servant. A talent is a, a figure of money back in, in those days, and it represented about a million dollars in today's money. So 20 years wages. So the first servant, he gives five talents, five million dollars, and he says, while I leave, you're in charge of this money, invest it, care for it, and return it to me when I get back. To the second servant, he gives two talents, or two million dollars, and says, take care of this for me. And to the third servant, he gives one talent, or one million dollars. And then he leaves for a long time, and those servants go to work. So when the master comes back, the, the first servant with five talent, he doubles his money. He says, here, master, I've doubled the money that you gave me. The second servant does the same thing, doubles the money. The third servant, he's kind of like a naughty teenage boy. He's like, I, I think he's looking at the other servants and he's like, wait a second, that one got five, that other servant got two, I only got one talent. This master is not a good person. He's unfair, he's unjust, I do not like him. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take my one talent and I'm gonna bury it in the ground. And that way when he comes back, he'll get what he gave me, no more, no less. Because he's not a good person and I don't feel like working for him. So the master comes back, he rewards the first and second servant, but the third servant, he calls wicked. He says, you wicked and indolent servant, lazy. You disregarded what I gave you to steward on my behalf and therefore there's gonna be great judgment on you. And he's cast out from the master's estate. So this parable puts the fear of God in me. What if I'm a one talent servant that buries the talent? What if that's me? How do I know? What is a talent anyway to God? So this is a parable. It's, it's obviously a metaphor for the gifts and resources and abilities and opportunities that God gives you and me. So God's given us all something and we're supposed to do something with it, double it theoretically or honor God with it. But how do I know I'm not a person that buries the talent God gave me? or that I wasted, or what if I, there's five talents I'm supposed to manage and I only take care of four, what does God think of that? So I wanna look at Genesis one today, and I wanna look at work, vocation, and creation care in terms of how God made it from the very beginning of time. How do I honor God in the way that he designed me to do my work on his behalf? So. I want to give us today four talents that God gives every single one of us to steward on his behalf. The first talent is found in Genesis 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This is really interesting. There, as far as I know, there's no other religion on the planet that says humans were created in God's image. In fact, in the earliest creation myths, the, the god Marduk created humans so that humans could be slaves for the gods and humans could do work on behalf of the gods. But humans were less, less than anything special to the earliest gods. So when Moses writes that God created man, he created you and me in his image, that's really special. That means something significant. In the olden days, the, king would take, the kings of old would take their image and they would put it on coins, on flags, in artwork, on statues, and they'd put it all over the kingdom. So wherever there was culture and society, everyone knew whose kingdom they were in because of the king's image was there. And in the same way, when God puts his image on you and on me, it's his way of saying, this is my kingdom, and these are my representatives, my vice regents, my deputies. Everywhere you see humans on this planet, you see some piece of God's rulership. When we encounter a human living rightly, we encounter a piece in an image of who God is and what God looks like. So the first talent, the first thing that all of us have to steward if we're going to be a faithful image bearer in God's kingdom, first and important talent is above all else, we need to know God. We need to know God. That's what being an image bearer implies. There's no way around this. The first servant, or the third servant, the one talent servant in the parable failed because he didn't know who his master was. He thought his master was unjust, so he didn't do anything on his master's behalf. And we'll fail if we don't know who our God is. We can't represent him if we don't know what he looks like and what he wants from us. So say it were wartime, and all of us were drafted. And we were drafted to a medical unit. And in two weeks, we were going to hit the beaches, and we were going to be medics in an actual battlefield. And let's, let's say that, just for argument's sake, none of us have any former medical training or interest in medicine. So what, what would we have to do urgently and immediately in, in the two weeks before we hit the battle? We'd have to learn how, what medicine is, what humans are, what healthy humans look like, what unhealthy humans look like, how to make unhealthy humans healthy, what my job is, what the person's job next to me is. So if we're gonna be medics, on, in a battlefield, we have to know what our role is and what medicine does. And in the same way, when we get this mandate that we're made in the image of God and we're going to be his representatives in his creation, we have to know who God is, what he looks like, and how we can serve him. In fact, there's two things that we have to know right from the top. First, who God is, what he looks like, and how we image him forth. And second, we actually have to know ourselves. We have to accurately look at ourselves and say, do I look like the God whose image I'm made in, or am I representing some other God with my, my, with my actions? And I want to lev leverage this even further. So let's say we only had Genesis 1 to figure out who God was. If we were to look back over this, this slide about how God made the world, what can it tell us about who God is so that we know how to image him forth? You can go to the next slide for me. So if you look at creation here, we can see first of all that God ordered creation very, very beautifully, very poetically, very artistically. So he starts by separating light from darkness. Darkness was like a form of chaos and disorder. When it's dark, you can't do anything, you can't see. And so God separated light and darkness. So the first thing God did in creation is he made a boundary between the light and the dark. Second thing he did is he separated the sea from the sky. He put a boundary between where the waters are and where the sky is. The third day between the, the land and the sea. So he's putting boundaries up and he's separating chaos from darkness. Fourth day, he makes the sun, moon, stars. Fifth, six days, he starts filling the planet. Now look at how these days parallel each other. Day one to four, day two to five, day three to six. Look at that for a minute. See if you can spot the parallels there. What's God doing here? There's a symmetry here. So if on the first day he creates light and darkness, on the fourth day to parallel that, he fills the light and darkness with the sun, the moon, and the stars. Second day, the sea and the sky, 
fifth day, to parallel that, he makes fish and birds to fill the sea and the sky. Land and plants, and then humans and animals fill the, that land and the plants. So you can see there's an order to how creation works. He starts from very general, general overall canvas, and then he fills it with specific things. You look at these paintings around the church, which I love, by the way, this is awesome. You can tell the artist, he started with a blank canvas, first of all, and then probably the first thing he did is he did an outline of, the, of generally what he wanted to make, a human form, and then he started filling it in with all the specifics. This artist was acting divine when he made this art. He's, he's bearing the image of his creator when he acts like God does in how he creates. So in our work and in our vocation, as image bearers, we want to imitate what God is doing here. And that's, first of all, we plan what our work looks like. We set boundaries between chaos and disorder and, and life and order and goodness. So Monday morning, you're probably, you've got an email inbox that's full. You've got people with demands on you. You've got bosses with demands on you. Your job as an image bearer is to put boundaries on the chaos and create order coming out of that. To, take, to spread God's shalom across the world. To create life, beauty, goodness, and order. Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 27 and 28 Moses goes on, he says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. If you don't speak Hebrew very well, it looks like this text is saying God only made men in his image, but not women. And some people have actually concluded that when they read this in English. But if you speak Hebrew, you do know that this word for man is not referring to the male gender. It's referring to humans as a species. So when, when, when Moses writes, God created man, it's like you should, you should hear mankind or humans in general. And then when he says male and female, he created him. This is modifying the subject of the verse right before it. So man is a species that God created in his image. Male and female are the subtypes that God created within mankind. And then he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This underscores that there's an incompleteness to the individual person. There's something lacking in the image of God within one person themselves. We're designed to be in community. We're designed to be inter interdependent with other image bearers. So if you, if you encounter this person in your life or you are this person yourself, a lone ranger, who is either a narcissist or a sociopath or a hermit or a recluse. You gotta know that that person that's totally focused on themselves, that's the solo, that's an individualist, is not really representing the image of God well. God made us to be completely interdependent on the entire, uh, the entire population of humanity that he created in his image. So it's not one person that's the image of God, it's all of us as a species that represents God's image. That means that each person in this room is unique and special, and you uniquely have a piece of God's image that no one else has. And when we're together as a whole, we represent who God is. So talent number two, if you're gonna, if you're gonna not bury your talent in the ground, we need to live in interdependence with other image bearers. That's a must if you're gonna be on this planet. When Jesus read this 2,000 years ago as he studied the Pentateuch, he concluded that the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. First of all, love God with all your heart. Secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. Be interdependent with other human beings. So let's reflect on this for a minute. Are we interdependent? Are you specifically inter interdependent? Here's some questions to ask. Do you have close relationships? Do you personally have close relationships? The way to check that would be um, the people that are most intimate in your life, a spouse, children, parents, siblings. Are your relationships with those people the healthiest that they can be within your control? Let's say your car breaks down on 94 or 294. Is there someone in your life that you can call that will drop whatever they're doing and come to your side to rescue you? Do you have that in your life? And are you that person for someone else? If you get sick or incarcerated, will people visit you? Or do you visit people that are sick or incarcerated? If you've been unfairly bullied, 
Do others fly to your side to stand up for you? If your answer is no to these questions, you lack people that are close to you, you're probably feeling an emptiness because that you're, you're living outside the way that God designed you to be. And it's, it's a reason to cause pause and reflection and reevaluate whether you're living into God's image as he wants you to. Now, in your vocation, in your work, what does it mean to be interdependent with other image bearers in your work? Well, I think, first of all, you have to view every single person you work with as a fellow image bearer. They deserve your love and your respect and, and you to be life-giving to be around because we recognize that every human being is special and unique, made to look like God the Father. Secondly, there's this class of people that God talks about all over the Bible. He calls them widows, orphans, and foreigners, or sojourners. These are the people that are completely dependent on others for help. In your work, do you support these people or do you exploit them? It's really rich if you exp exploit people that can't help themselves. It's hard to be a person that supports and cares for those that can't care for themselves. But that's what being an image bearer calls us to do. We care for those that are dependent on others. Third, more, more specifically, how we work with uh, God's creation. Looking at verse 28, it says, And God blessed them, and I'm going to skip, and he said, Fill the earth, subdue it, or the Hebrew word is kabosh, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves. This word, subdue, the Hebrew word is kabosh. Does that word sound familiar at all? To put the kabosh on something? I'm going to go put the kabosh on these plans. It's Yiddish. And, it, and it, it's actually, it's a Hebrew military term. And remember, sin hasn't entered the world yet, but this is what God is describing our task on earth is. We need to put the kibosh on this world. And that, not in a sinful way, but we put the kibosh in God's image. But God is implying that when we serve him on this planet, there is gonna be resistance, there's gonna be challenge, it's gonna be hard, there's even gonna be conflict. And part of bearing God's image means that we do hard things. So that is a military term. And it actually literally means to conquer. So what happened is when God made the earth, where he, he made what he called the Garden of Eden. And the Hebrew word for garden means walled garden. So it's this gated little safe place that's full of life and water and food and God's presence dwells there. But outside the Garden of Eden, it's a wild creation. It's not evil, it's not sinful, but it is wild. And what God intended for his image bearers is to start pushing those walls out and start taming the wild and bringing order to the chaos that's outside of the garden. So I assume that in, in Eden, back in the earth, before sin happened, there were deserts that needed to be explored. And these deserts were hot and dangerous. There were icy mountains that needed to be climbed. And there were even dragons that needed to be slain on God's behalf to tame a wild creation. And, and as image bearers, it was our privilege and joy to subdue the creation in an ethical, God-honoring, image-bearing way. I want to look at three social psychologists that confirm this is how God designed the planet. These three guys, uh, you can go to the next slide. As far as I know, they're not Christian. They don't love Jesus. They're just studying how the world works and how people work. Oh, by the way, the third talent, engage in challenge and conflict to produce order. That is part of our design as an image bearer. I have to engage in hard things. God made us for that. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So these three guys, they're social psychologists. You might have heard of some of their names. Mike Sheik sent me hi uh, He developed the concept or he discovered the concept of flow. You may have heard this work, word. Anyone heard of flow? It's this idyllic state of work where you just are loving what you do in your work so much you get lost in work. You lose track of time. You don't get hungry. You don't have physical needs. You just throw yourselves into work. Well, what I discovered is to enter the state of flow, the ideal state of work on the planet, there has to be an active level. If you are not challenged in work, you will never enter the flow state and you will be bored to tears. 
So as a side note, if you're in a job right now that is monotonous and boring and it, it takes the life out of your soul and you hate it, you're probably not being challenged. You're probably living less than God intended for you. It might be time to evaluate whether that job was what God wanted you to do. Second, uh, Martin Seligman. He concluded that if we routinely withdraw and disengage from challenge, we'll enter a state of what he calls unlearned helplessness. We enter this uh, state where we, if you don't encounter hard things, you get weaker and weaker and then depression ensues and you start to lose life and wilt as a human. You don't flourish. So you have to intentionally engage in challenge to flourish. And last, Jonathan Haidt, he was studying children in America. What he was noticing that as the generations progressed and had easier and easier lives, and as we accumulated more wealth as human beings, our kids were getting weaker and more and more fragile. And so he, as he studied, his conclusion was that if you want to raise a resilient child that's strong and healthy, your kid has to go through negative emotions and difficult things. In other words, your kid has to lose at sports, they have to get bullied at school, they have to encounter pain, and they have to go through intentional discipline. If your kid goes through those things, it produces strong and resilient children. If your kid doesn't have those things, they, they come out weak and fragile. So as a whole, these three psychologists determined you have to engage with challenge, hard things, pain, conflict, if you want to grow as a human being. And what I'm saying today is that's how God intended us from the very beginning. Before sin happened, he designed us to challenge and enter into hard things. Let's go to the next slide here. Have any of you heard of Biosphere 2? My, I think it's also called Biodome. So a space company in like the 1990s, they wanted to recreate life on the moon to see if they could grow plants and, and livestock and animals on the moon someday. And so they built this, this facility out in Arizona, Oracle, Arizona, and they made it windless because there's no wind on the moon. They made it, uh, uh, there's like no thunder, no lightning, no, no rain, no, no elements essentially on this planet. So what they discovered is when plants are in Biosphere 2, they would grow really fast, like faster than any plant here on the planet outside of the dome. But right as the plant hit maturity, mat yeah, full maturity, the plant would fall over and die every single time. They couldn't figure it out, couldn't figure it out. $150 million later, they finally discovered if you want a plant to be strong, it has to be out in the elements. What makes a plant and a tree's roots grow is the wind beating on it, the thunder hitting it, the snow, the intense sun. All those things makes a plant strong. All of this is essentially a metaphor for how God designed you and me. If we want to grow fully into God's image, we have to endure great challenge. So the third talent, once again, is we have to embrace challenge conflicts. Don't engineer stress out of your life. It's actually a good thing if, it's, if there's not too much stress. God uses it to grow us. And last, looking at chapter 2 of Genesis. If your Bible's like mine, all these words are jumbled together really tightly. But I kind of separated it out here so you could see the poetry of what Moses was doing. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So you see this work, work that he had done, work that he had done, it gets repeated three times. Seventh day gets repeated three times. Rest gets repeated twice. When you repeat something, especially in poetry, what does that mean? It's, Im it's important, yes. When, especially in Hebrew poetry, if it's repeated three times, that means that it's very, very, very important. It's easy to miss if you don't, if you don't uh, understand Hebrew poetry. So, what God is doing here is he is emphasizing that this something really important is going on right here. As you can see, there's no command here for us. It's just describing what God did. This is a literary tactic that in modern days is called Chekhov's gun. Go to the next slide. So Anton Chekhov was a playwright and a uh, short story writer back in the 1800s, 1900s. 
This is what he said about Chekhov's gun. This is really fascinating. When you write a story, remove everything that has no relevance to the story. If you say in the first act that there is a gun hanging on the wall, then in the second act it absolutely must go off. If it's not going to be fired, it shouldn't be hanging there. So if you're a writer, you know if you're going to place a gun in the first act of your story, it's got to be used in the second act. Otherwise, don't waste words by putting it there. In the same way, when, God writes that, when Moses writes that God rested on the seventh day and emphasizes it three times, that is the gun that's going to be fired in the second act of the Bible. Sabbath is a pattern that's pointing to something very, very specific. Sabbath is pointing actually to Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus Christ came to earth, he announced to all of creation, I am your Sabbath rest. Come to me, every one of you that's weary, and I will actually give you complete and full rest. But that's not for today. For now, all we want to note when God made, God made rest is that the Israelites, when they read that, that would have been life-giving to them. Remember, the Israelites are in the wilderness at the time that Genesis is written, and they've just come out of Egypt. What was their status in Egypt, by the way? Slavery. They never got a day off. Never. The, the Egyptian gods did not care for human life, and so they worked Israelites until they died. And so God worked this miraculous exodus. He saved the Israelites. And then he tells them here in Genesis, by the way, be like me, and I rest one day a week. So that would have been life-giving to an Israelite. Wow, the God that rescued us cares for us. And not only that, he's giving us a day off where we can just rest. We never rested before. This is incredible. At the end of the day, I believe that Sabbath rest signifies that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you take one day off to rest, you lose 15% productivity, right? If, if you're stressed about money and your margins are thin in your business, if you take one day off, that could sink your business. But God is trying to train us to depend completely on him. So talent number four, rest one day a week and set it apart as holy. That's who your God is and that's who we must imitate. So one more time, the four talents that God expects us all to, uh, to steward on his behalf. Number one, Know God above all else. God is most important in this life. Know him and love him with all your being. Second, live in interdependence with other human image bearers. And that's just my way of saying love your neighbor as yourself. Third, in your work you have to engage with challenge. And fourth, rest one day a week and set it apart as holy. That's the way that we demonstrate that we completely depend on God for all of life. Now, you see these three pieces of art. J.R.R. Tolkien he painted these himself for his book, The Hobbit. And I, and I think he actually had the parable of talents in mind when he wrote The Hobbit. And here's why. Remember the third servant? He took his talent and he buried it in a hole in the ground. Now this is how The Hobbit starts. And this is my closing point. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Oh, that sounds like the parable of the three talents. Now, it was, a, it was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. No going upstairs for the hobbit. Bedrooms, bathrooms, cellars, pantries, lots of pantries, wardrobes, and he had whole rooms devoted to clothes. Kitchens, dining rooms, all were on the same floor. Indeed, they were on the same passage. The best rooms were all on the left-hand side, for these were the only ones that had windows, deep-set round windows that looked over the garden and meadows beyond, sloping down to the river. This hobbit was a very well-to-do hobbit, and he had, in fact, settled down immovably. Think about what J.R. Tolkien is doing as he writes about the hobbit. He's saying the hobbit has buried himself in the ground and he's settled down with his comforts immovably. So this hobbit has rejected challenge. He's rejected hard things. He just lives for comforts. And so what I think Tolkien is saying here is, hobbit is the, the hobbit was the third servant in the parable of the talents that wasted his life by burying himself with his comforts. Now, Tolkien had two other characters that buried themselves in the ground in his novel, if you remember. There was Gollum. Gollum buried himself at the bottom of the Misty Mountain. Remember this? 
Gollum escaped from light, he escaped from sun, he escaped from other people, he escaped from work. All he did was he's, he lived and he existed for his one precious, for his one pleasure, and that was the entire meaning of his life. So Gollum is an addict as a uh, archetype. And what Tolkien is saying is he's criticizing Gollum's way of life. He's saying, don't be an addict. Don't bury yourself as, in a, as if you were a talent in the ground pursuing only one thing. That's a waste. And then this third, I don't know if you can see this real clearly, that's a dragon. He's living on a, a hoard of treasure. And underneath the hoard of treasure, I don't know if you can see this, but it's skeletons and bodies of human beings and elves. And this is Smaug. And this is the Smaug method of burying your talents. So Smaug cared about one thing, and that was the accumulation of treasure, and he did it at all costs, and he viewed other creatures as expendable for what he wanted. This is the uh, archetype for a sociopath or a sociopath, or a narcissist, or just plain pride. So if you wanna know how to waste your life, how to bury your talent in the ground, here's three ways according to Tolkien. You can be a Bilbo, and, and eradicate conflict and hard things from your life and just care about comfort. You can be a golem and just care about pleasure. Or you can be a smaug and pursue pride at the expense of all other life and all other people. So I, I want to close by encouraging us to not bury our talents, but to look closely at the resources, the opportunities, the abilities that God has given you and steward them on behalf of your father our Father, and be his image bearer. Let's pray. Lord, for your word, we thank you. We thank you for how you made this world to be good and for who you are and that we can imitate you. I pray, God, that each person here would take seriously the, the challenge of being like you and representing you to our work, to our friends, to our families, in our homes that your image would spread across this earth and that the whole entire earth and creation could know your peace and your shalom. Thanks for First Free. I pray that you would fill them with your spirit, guide this church to spread your kingdom here in Andersonville. In your name I pray, amen. Say
as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Jesus is calling Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Would you all stand with us as we close our time singing Hosanna? I see the King of Glory Coming on the clouds with fire The whole earth shakes The whole earth shakes I see His love and mercy Washing over all our sin The people sing The people sing generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith with selfless faith I see a near revival stirring as we pray and seek we're on our knees we're on our knees sing Hosea Hosanna, Hosanna, 
Amen. Well, would you put your hands in a posture of receiving as I um, give the benediction? Also, join us downstairs for church picnic and crazy craft day after this. But receive this benediction. May Jesus, our King of Kings, make his rule known in your life. May you echo the crowds as Jesus entered Jerusalem who praised and celebrated this king even though they did not yet know the nature and scope of his saving plan. May the glory of our king give you strength and excite you with reasons to worship even as we pray for his saving power over our world. May Jesus' humility as he draws near to heal us of our sin, give you hope that while we face this present storm and darkness, Jesus, the ultimate healer of our souls, will one day make all things new and right. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Mm -hmm.